Okay, so um, okay, so so first of all, uh, thank you for joining us here at IMF. And uh, before we proceed, uh, could you please introduce yourself to the listening audience of uh, IMF? Yeah. So uh, my name is Alexandros Kosmas. I am uh, the vice chairman of uh, Liberal Space Foundation. Also, um, member of the local uh, hyperspace in Greece. And uh, in general terms, I am uh, an open source enthusiast. And uh, you can call me an open source evangelist. Um, I used to write about um, open source back in uh, 2003 and 2004 uh, in local magazines. Uh, Linux magazines actually, and um, we separated the blog that was well, semi successful. Uh, but the thing is that uh, since uh, 2012, uh, 2011, I'm uh, actively uh, working together with people at the local hyperspace, and um, since uh, 2015, I'm working with. Uh, Lingua Space Foundation uh, to promote uh, open source, open hardware, and open data uh, in a more physical way uh, as possible. Meaning that uh, we're trying to not only uh, work on uh, software, uh, but take it a little bit further from building uh, simple stuff to building. Um, complicated spacecraft. Uh, that's what we try to do. Um, it's uh, a challenging task, uh, but it's uh, really interesting. It's, uh, it's a way to see technology uh, in a more open manner and a more uh, productive and ethical manner, if you ask me. That that sounds wonderful, you know, like uh, being involved in uh, space technology and uh, ensuring like everything takes place regarding the hardware and all the software and putting the whole community together. And I'm just so inspired about, you know, like you being an evangelist as well, so which is actually something most of the contributors tend not to be so much involved in. Okay, so we have been talking about uh, the Libre Space Foundation. So could you tell us what it's like uh, being the vice president and uh, basically just uh, could you tell us more about your work there as a vice president? Yeah, sure. So um, Libre Space Foundation is an organization promoting uh, open space technologies. Um, I joined the organization early on uh, in uh, 2014 before there was a, a legal notion of a Libre Space Foundation or anything like that. Um, since I was really comfortable with uh, figuring out the uh, licensing and um, uh, figuring out uh, strategic stuff like uh, we're gonna go GPL version three, or we're gonna go um, FreeBSD or MIT license, or which is the proper open hardware license to get that data. So yeah, um, at first uh, it was uh, more like um, just a team of people, and uh, to some extent. We are just a team of people, meaning that we are mostly friends. Uh, to some extent, we are like family. Uh, we are working together uh, because we choose to um, do interesting stuff, and we work together, especially in a physical space, like in a work on hyperspace, um, in a very, you know, um, close manner, uh, meaning that we work, we eat, uh, we travel together, you know, it's uh, usually uh, very, it used to be at least, a very localized yeah. thing. Uh, 
But nowadays it's not. Uh, the community is global and we love it. Uh, we like to see people from all over, more people from all over the world coming on. Um, uh, but yeah, the thing is that uh, it's also an everyday, uh, a day to day exercise on, the, uh, on these open source. Uh, what I mean by that is that you, uh, our work is done mostly, if not all, with uh, open source software and hardware. But, okay, that means that you uh, have to do all the financial stuff with or do, which is great. Um, uh, you do payments with a bill, which is awesome. Um, you keep uh, you design uh, things with a uh, key card. Uh, you use BBB for, um, to chat. Uh, our everyday, um, day to day operation is through open source uh, tools. We only use our cloud source systems and software to, to either um, uh, communicate uh, with um, formal organizations like the um, European Space Agency or like the um, Greek public sector, but only to that extent. If we can not use closed source and only the battery, we will really be using open source. We will opt in for open source uh, at any time. And that's uh, really interesting because you see, uh, well, especially in space, I mean, come on, you know, people are not used to use uh, uh, open source and that kind of stuff. Now there is, um, yeah, it's global at least, which is really yeah, yeah. It, it is uh, quite common, you know, like to find uh, government organizations don't really use uh, open source technologies, which is uh, something I feel like could be, it should be like something that is incorporated within government agencies and uh, other agencies that, like uh, of that sort. So, yeah, I, I just feel like it's something that uh, maybe there needs to be more sensitization and evangelism on how to use these specific tools because uh, I believe it would actually even be cost efficient for like these organizations to be able to run. So anyway, so True. what are some, yeah, so what are some of, uh, speaking about uh, promoting these technologies, so what are some of, uh, of these activities that uh, Libre, the Libre Space uh, Foundation has taken, you know, like to promote some of these open space technologies that you use and uh, some of, uh, to just push them out for the public, for the contributors, and bas basically for just people who are interested in learning about these technologies and using them probably in their career. So what are some of those uh, evangelist activities that you you currently undertake at Libre Space Foundation? Yeah. Well, actually, uh, you see, um, when we are developing uh, uh, open source software in uh, free software, actually, uh, in such a niche market, uh, you have to take into account that on in one hand, you have to be inclusive to make people that are not uh, used to these kind of technologies and these kinds of sort of concepts. I mean, I wasn't used uh, in satellite communications. Uh, I never had training about it. I, uh, my country uh, had no space program uh, before the uh, Space Foundation started. Um, so um, it's normal to think about uh, getting new people on board, uh, introducing new technologies to people. And that's something that we do uh, with um, our uh, partners in um, Harvard and FISA in uh, Center for Astrophysics uh, in the United States of America. Uh, we're working on uh, LSTM, 
it's a project that brings uh, technologies like SATNOX, the um, uh, satellite ground station network uh, will maintain and uh, develop uh, to public libraries. So our um, partners in uh, Harvard are actually creating uh, a curriculum uh, for uh, people to get introduced to satellite communications, to lower orbit um, satellites, and to figure out what kind of data uh, we collect, what kind of uh, data Satmux holds and how it operates, and how you can operate your own ground station, either in the public library or uh, on your own terrace, or your own um, backyard, or your own um, school or high school or university. I don't know. Uh, so we do that to promote what we kind of do. We, because we are a non-profit foundation, we are um, powered and uh, inspired by a vision of uh, access uh, to space for all mankind. We say a manifesto. Uh, we ask people to get inspired by that and uh, uh, get introduced on our ideas. And through that manifesto, we actually so what um, ideas mean for uh, people uh, that are interested in space, meaning that uh, we need to use space for peaceful purposes and we need to use space for the betterment of all mankind and stuff like that. On the other hand, uh, a very important part of um, Space and how we do stuff in space, and in general, in uh, most industries, uh, is the industry itself, either uh, the academics or uh, for profit corporations, and you have to interface with them. And you have to interface with them in order to uh, solve them the opportunities that come with open source. And uh, provide them uh, with enough uh, knowledge to figure out that if they do follow uh, open source methodologies on what they do, uh, it will have an uh, impact on their work, it will uh, allow them to focus on uh, other innovation that may want to go further with. And, Give them a competitive act. Let's be honest about it. Um, so, yeah, uh, there are several stuff that we are trying to do. We always keep an eye on uh, being open and being uh, as welcoming and as possible to communities and to people that are not uh, yet uh, introduced to open source. Uh, we try to facilitate students, especially with a uh, new summer of code that uh, we are over, uh, the last three years we were on board and we were picked by Google to get people work on uh, open source for space. And it's really interesting because you see people that are not really comfort uh, comfortable with Git to start, do small steps, get themselves a little bit comfortable with it, and then uh, slowly, but gradually, uh, to allow them to build stuff that we use uh, for production uh, services like uh, Subworks or like uh, Polaris or machine learning too. So, yeah. But it's a challenge. It's always a challenge. Yeah, yeah. I understand, you know, like being in uh, the open source uh, field myself. I, I feel like uh, there's not so much evangelism that happens about uh, some of these uh, products. 
so it's uh, it's quite hard you know like to push out and uh, put the products out there for people to use and also it's uh, difficult like from my own experience uh, I feel like uh, most of the projects like I was able to join it was quite difficult for me to get on board especially most of the time when I didn't really have uh, the necessary experience to be on board and uh, so I felt intimidated with uh, the size of the project and uh, that was really uh, an issue so I I, um, I understand like the work that you do to help out students to be able to build, you know, like this uh, space equipment and put them like in the backyard or use them at the university. That's really something that I find to be really awesome that you're doing there. Because I think it's uh, quite important, you know, like to groom someone and uh, bring them to, to the level where they are comfortable to contribute. So, yeah. So I think I saw a tweet that you previously shared and uh, you had said something to do with uh, space shouldn't be Akron. And then, uh, so do you believe uh, the current state of like uh, space uh, knowledge and technology in the world is, uh, is, is in this state of being Akron? Or, and uh, what, what do you think uh, you need to do in order to, to be able to make it more accessible to people across the globe around there? Because I think uh, have, you, you have mentioned something to do with uh, the Google Summer of Code. And uh, that's, I think, a large opportunity for most of the students globally to be involved. So, yeah, so what are some of the things that you think you could probably add on top of maybe that Google Summer of Code, maybe uh, like outreach programs that could possibly push, you know, like uh, this uh, space technology? to people who don't really understand in other parts of the world and that's basically for them to be able to know what space is about and uh, if it's something that they could be involved in as well. So here's the thing, uh, for large part of uh, space history and um, history in general, uh, space was uh, the privilege of uh, big nations, of superpowers, actually. Yes, yes, uh, yes. It wasn't about you and me, or it wasn't about even people from these superpowers. It was about the state itself. Uh, that's understandable to some extent because uh, uh, the to the, the access to electronics and engineering uh, was limited, and uh, it was really difficult even for a big corporation uh, to do this kind of stuff. Uh, NASA was, would uh, have to come in, or uh, the Soviets would uh, need to come in, and. Uh, use the all the state machinery to actually uh, create a space program. That's to some extent understandable. And to some extent, uh, that was a byproduct of the Cold War. Um, so states and uh, uh, people used to uh, cover space with uh, less details, a little bit confidential, a little bit of secret. It used to be like that. Um, things uh, happened, uh, the Cold War ended, so, uh, to some extent. Um, people are uh, trying to see how they can do it more efficiently. Uh, one answer would be that um, corporations would come in and uh, use proprietary technologies. That's one answer. One other answer would be to open up technologies that should be available. But what we see in the space sector uh, is that even the simplest things, even a simple, simple, even a student satellite is actually a new invention in itself. It's the same concept, it's the same things, and we're doing it all over again. Because 
you have to design it yourself to, to the most extent and people are not used to share code, share schematics, uh, share every, all the data. That changes. Uh, that, and, uh, that's gradual stay, uh, change. Uh, there are countries uh, that uh, have several regulations that people in the pro however they like. Uh, there are people in the uh, United States that, uh, that do, that do um, open source uh, in software, but not hardware in space because, yeah, mm -hmm. there, there is IT. Uh, but on the other part, there are people that uh, on the organizations like JPL that promote open source in space. Now, uh, in a few this time we're going to see a helicopter a drone fly on Mars and that thing runs Linux. I mean, that's cool. And uh, JPL was actually released code that runs on the thing. And you can see their code, say, it's a nice code. Or uh, NASA has released the code uh, a long time ago. Of uh, OpenMC, I'm oh, oh, sorry, OpenMCT. It's an open source uh, machine control uh, system. This is really cool. Really cool. Um, you see that people are like the European Space Agency are looking on uh, space technology and they're looking at organizations like us and say, yeah, I knew something. These guys are open source. But you better pick them because the code will be there always. That's really important. And uh, to some extent, uh, you will see that in order to have impact uh, in uh, space, in my humble opinion at least, it's not just an organization like, uh, F, uh, like Liberal Space Foundation that should do the job. Uh, it's um, for space organizations, um, uh, for um, space agencies, uh, national space agencies, some international space agencies, to see the opportunity in uh, promoting open source. Um, we see small steps like NASA and TISA, and hopefully we will see more. Uh, what we are trying to do, on uh, that matter of fact, is to open up some open day so a national uh, space agency can come and say, you know something, we can do that. We can promote uh, the use of open source in our own um, projects or in, um, Projects uh, for um, students and uh, for uh, to start up and bootstrap our space industry, uh, but it's time. Uh, we try to persuade them, uh, but it's and we try to persuade them with code and we try to persuade them uh, producing uh, studies, but it needs work. Uh, for us, we are trying to, op to have a very open com uh, community and provide opportunities to people that uh, are already contributors to the community uh, to further enhance their contributions. I mean, the country uh, through partnerships, but that's a challenge for a small organization like the Industry Foundation. It's just, I'm not an organization that it's on a relatively small country, like Greece. Um, uh, but it does have some impact, and uh, I think that uh, in the future we will see more uh, initiatives, not only from us, as a Liberal Space Foundation, uh, but uh, from space agencies themselves. There, there, is, uh, there are people that are uh, 
hanging out in our communities that are working for uh, space agencies. And these people talk to their colleagues. And they say, you know something, oh, we should open such that thing. Why would we have it closed source? It's a pity. Let's open source. And, yeah. and you know, that, that, that's a great impact of open source. I know, I know. I, I, I feel like, you know, like uh, opening up like the software, like one organization making the first step to make the software open encourages other organizations to take the same path. Yes. So it has been uh, done with most of, you know, like uh, the legacy software that we use on our computers. So, yeah, I feel like it's uh, more or more less the same thing here. And I feel like if more and more organizations, like I've said, uh, make try to make this uh, software more open and uh, available to people to use, then it encourages, you know, like more people to get within the field. And of course, I think uh, maybe these countries also have to, you know, like come up and then collaborate and then uh, see for the greater benefit of like uh, the technology to advance it and and uh, basically just to promote it. So, yeah, so another thing uh, that I saw maybe is uh, Lib the Libre Space Foundation supports uh, the SAT nodes, uh, which, is, which happens to be like a global satellite network uh, that is built as an open source project. So could you share with us uh, how this technology is, uh, how you're making this yeah. technology available for like ordinary users, like you said? So, well, actually, um, you can say that uh, although the Indo Space Foundation supports and maintains Satmos, Indo Space Foundation was born from Satmos. Oh, so here's the thing. Um, in 2014, we started uh, working on a uh, NASA Space Art Challenge. Uh, it's a global hackathon. Uh, the goal is to build open source solutions, uh, and uh, if you get to build a really awesome open source solution, uh, NASA will give you a ticket to view a launch from uh, uh, Canada or something like that. So, yeah, that's cool, that's interesting, that's fun. Um, okay, okay, it's fun because it's open source. But the thing is that we started working on that. Um, it's a manual event, uh, a local hackerspace, um, does the event in Athens, Greece. Uh, we won once. Um, it was uh, around, um, yeah, 2013 that we won. Uh, some of us had the chance to check out and see the Naval Lands uh, for Mars, and that, that was good. So, yeah, the thing is that uh, when we started working on that, and um, we had the chance to check out new challenge of the National Space of Challenge, and there was a challenge for building a, a virtual ground station, uh, which was quite interesting. Uh, we took that opportunity and uh, started working on that. It was a really basic thing at first. Uh, although we didn't make that uh, year's challenge, um, it took the liberty to go forward with this, uh, continuing working on that. And we did. Uh, so, in late 2014, we won, uh, Hackaday Prize, and, uh, yeah. Actually, the Hackaday Prize was around 200,000 euros, which was a lot of money for a small organization like ours in uh, Greece. That was a uh, challenge economically at the time. 
so the chance to start the space foundation uh, so yeah in a, in, a ter in some some terms you can say that the space foundation is actually a product of uh, satmos so um, yeah we started working on that uh, satmos is a satellite ground station the ground stations can be really complicated um, people have put uh, radio telescopes on the network, but actually can be really simple too. Uh, you just you just need uh, a simple antenna, relatively simple antenna. It has smaller uh, footprint that um, uh, a television antenna. Uh, Raspberry Pi. Uh, very cheap as they are. Nothing more. It's enough to build the ground. Go forward with it. Uh, um, if you have any technical issues with uh, either reschedule or a um, do that question again, whatever you want. I have done. So we can, we can, yeah, we can yeah, uh, yeah, maybe yeah. we can proceed with uh, what, how, uh, the questions we have been having. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, would you like to do that uh, question about um, Satmux again? Uh, because, uh, yeah, I lost you a little bit over there and I started the uh, Bumming and not making a lot of sense because I myself. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think we shall maybe like edit out some uh, parts. I think so. Yeah, yeah. maybe we can. We are basically just talking about. Uh, we were basically talking about uh, the what 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 exactly you are doing uh, to make the sad uh accessible, something like that. So yeah, maybe we can proceed from there. Okay, so um, here's the thing about Saturn. Um, one can say that the uh, Liberal Space Foundation itself is a byproduct of Saturn. Um, when we started working on Saturn, we started working on Saturn before uh, even the uh, Liberal Space Foundation was an idea. So we were hanging out on a local hackerspace. Uh, we were participating in uh, NASA Space Up Challenge, which is a great hackathon, a yearly hackathon that uh, uh, how lovely. And uh, the focus of the hackathon is to for NASA to provide challenges to the contestants, to teams, and they should uh, solve these challenges using uh, open solutions. Technological or either kind. So it's really cool, it's really open, it's nice. Um, back in 2013, uh, a local hyperspace had won uh, that uh, contest. People have uh, went to Florida, seen a uh, launch of a uh, rocket to space, which was really cool. And we said, yeah, we want to do that too again. Yeah. So we've seen uh, several challenges. Uh, NASA puts up uh, fair enough, uh, enough challenges to keep everyone busy and everyone interested. So we've seen a challenge about building a virtual satellite ground station. Um, we're like, uh, OK, let's start tackling that. We like uh, we, 
a lot of us uh, were uh, radio amateurs, a lot of us uh, had the fascination with astronomy and stuff like that. A lot of us were engineers and uh, social developers. So yeah, he said, let's start doing that. Well, when you start doing that and you have access to hardware and uh, machinery and to uh, 3D printers and uh, stuff like that, then you think about, well, why should it be uh, a virtual thing? Let's do it a real thing. Let's build some. Let's build a rotator that moves around. Uh, so, yeah. When we said, yeah, but this rotator is really simple to build and you can read on your own hackerspace. And if you have a 3D printer, you can read it on your own uh, backyard. So, why not make a network out of that? And, uh, yeah. Didn't want anything, anything at all. It was just a good project. Uh, but the thing is that we worked on uh, building it uh, a little bit more. And in uh, late 2014, we had the chance to participate in uh, the Hacker Day Prize contest. So, Mr. Nautwell. And we yeah. won the Hackaday project. Uh, we won the first prize, which is around two hundred thousand dollars, which is a lot oh, of money. That's amazing. Yeah, it's a lot of money. But we were ten people, um, and yeah, we could divide the money and buy a new car, which is huge. <laughs> um, yeah. Stuff around the house or stuff around the hardware space. But we did something mm -hmm. else. We said yeah. we're gonna create a non profit and that will a non profit will take that money and uh, we'll try to build new open source technologies, build up on what we had already built on Satnox, which was not a lot, and uh, go forward with that. Um, nowadays, that uh, Sadmux is a mature project, really mature project. Um, people can participate in Sadmux easily, easily enough, okay. meaning that um, you can actually build a ground station uh, using a Raspberry Pi. Um, and uh, CPSDR, uh, like uh, 20 US dollars or something. Uh, and uh, a small footprint antenna, meaning that uh, the antenna you need is smaller than the classical uh, antennas used for uh, TV. So, yeah. You can build such a simple thing. Okay, I understand that people, some people are interested in more complicated stuff, and that why, that's why we've created a, an open hardware design for a rotator that you can actually 3D print the gears. So you can do your data by yourself or local hacker space or your local university. And even if uh, something breaks, like the gear, you can fit it the gear. So, uh, it's a, uh, okay, the organizations, serious organizations that have put uh, on the network more complicated than the systems, like radio telescopes that are not used for, uh, when they are not used for uh, astronomy, and uh, uh, we need to hunt satellites, yeah. Uh, they got them on network and um, we can uh, facilitate that too. So nowadays, Satmux is a, a pro, uh, has around 410 or more uh, ground stations all over the globe. We need more ground stations in Africa. Hopefully we will get them. Um, 
and uh, I can't you on that. On that, I you live in Uganda, right? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, yeah, yeah. We we're gonna take advantage of it. Um, so uh, the thing is that ground stations operate uh, through the network. They provide data on uh, the database of uh, satellites, and people can participate uh, without even building a ground station because you know uh, some radio amateurs love their Windows machines and their expensive radios, so they can send us data directly. We can do that too, but all the data is open. So, of course, uh, interested uh, mostly on uh, scientific missions and uh, experimental missions and missions that are uh, doing science. We don't have data from uh, other satellites. And, uh, okay, so. So here's the thing, what we're trying to promote this kind of stuff, so not only do we develop the thing, uh, and we are trying uh, to work with our partners to promote uh, good practices on uh, uh, getting uh, people uh, on board. And, uh, that means that uh, we work with uh, Harvard, and we work with the uh, Center for Astrophysics team, uh, created a curriculum about that, and we try to uh, keep a very modular design on what we do. So people can uh, get on board with any uh, hardware they have, which is really important. Uh, Hardware for uh, that kind of stuff is uh, complicated people and tends to be expensive. So if you, if people, if the university, for example, has any hardware already there, uh, it's a little bit of an issue uh, to get new. So having a modular design, uh, people can get on the network and by being on the network, they can actually coordinate with other operators globally. So, for example, if there is a, a university uh, like uh, uh, from Ecuador, a small country, uh, that wants to pick up their satellite, but, you know, they're close to the equator, actually on the equator, and yeah, they don't have enough passes as they would like for uh, to catch their satellite every day. So, how are they going to get their data? Well, uh, being part of the network allows the university uh, and allows the global to com community to coordinate with them uh, to get the data to the scientific community easily for everyone to use. And that's really important. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, yeah of course, that, that... Uh, of course, yeah. uh, having that kind of um, setups and uh, servers and stuff like that, uh, it needs some kind of infrastructure that's provided by the Libre Space Foundation. Uh, and we are trying to help uh, people not only uh, use the network, but actively participate on uh, how it's designed and how it's uh, coded. It's really important. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, you, you you talked about uh, some bits of uh, the satellite technology. So what about? Uh, uh, you talked about something to do with satellite communication, and uh, just could you elaborate more about, uh, just give a simple snapshot of what uh, satellite communication is about, and uh, how best yeah. can you 
maybe describe it for someone who doesn't know what satellite communications is about. So here's the thing. Uh, satellite communications are uh, communications done via satellite either in a geocentric, uh, geostatic orbit, like the one you use uh, to CTV. Or more complicated, when you are trying to communicate with a low Earth orbiting satellite, usually most scientific satellites are low Earth orbiting satellites that you can uh, that actually pass over your head. Five, ten minutes every day, and then they go on their way. And yet, in a few days later, they're gonna pass again and stuff like that. So, satellite communications are the task to figure out a way, usually through using the electromagnetic spectrum, to communicate data from the satellite to Earth and from Earth to um, the satellite, it's uh, the um, thing of the satellite communications industry. But what we are trying to do is uh, to take that concept, uh, the concepts around uh, satellite communications, and say, you know, some Stuff that we uh, some of the technologies needed for uh, satellite communications can be open source and should be open source. And being open source would uh, allow uh, a more fair um, way to the business and a more fair way to work as a scientist or as an engineer uh, on, in space. Um, we have released some uh, um, studies on that, on how an uh, open source can be used uh, to promote the uh, the technologies around the satellite communications and uh, how to promote uh, innovation around that. But, of course, uh, a lot of work has to be needed more to go forward. Uh, it's a challenge, and it's a challenge that, to some extent, where we undertake and coordinate with the rest of our uh, industry, and we are trying to do that uh, in the coming days. We are going to release some uh, opportunities for people to work on uh, satellite communications uh, via bounties uh, yeah. to further expand that kind of uh, technology. It's a pilot project. I mean, it's not the ultimate solution to everything, but it's... Uh, a step to the right direction. Sounds good. Yeah. So, so basically, uh, what, what, what do you think uh, in terms of uh, hardware, uh, what is limiting, what's like a huge limiting factor for most of the people who, who are interested in, let's say, like contributing to some of these pilot projects that you have been talking about? Uh, and uh, what measures has... Uh, the Libre Space Foundation put in place to for contributors to be able to access, let's say, like uh, the open source uh, satellites, like uh, the ones that you have talked about by the universities. And uh, are, are there like really any limitations in terms of uh, security, uh, or probably like any sort of like restrictions uh, that are available in these particular satellites? So here's the thing. Uh, first and foremost, mm, I believe that uh, an important uh, thing about uh, the limitations on uh, open space technology is indeed uh, open hardware. 
Um, same op uh, hardware is tough, and difficult, it's hard. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is uh, something all the industry says all over the time. Uh, part or uh, important factors of making that hard is that usually, at least in, until very recently, people use closed source technologies to develop hardware. Nowadays, you can use KiCad and uh, for the mechanical uh, for the mechanical part, you can use uh, FreeCAD and the result will be sufficient even for space. That's critical. That couldn't happen a few years ago or it would be really difficult. Now, it's something doable. To some extent, yeah. Uh, you need to work, you need to... Uh, of course, you need to um, test your equipment. Of course, you need to have a very careful test campaign for your satellites and your har the hardware that goes to space. That's, that's standard. I and mean, you, you can't skip that. But that should be done, period. But what you have to take that in, into account is that by documenting stuff, by doing a proper design and an open source design, using open source tool, can allow people to have better access technology, meaning that um, a student can go check out the design of a uh, Ubisoft, say, ah, this works to the extent that I can use it for my own mission, uh, or I need to make a small change uh, in order to facilitate my mission's uh, needs. Uh, then focus on uh, what he's trying to do, on uh, his payload, uh, on her payload, on uh, how they would, on uh, the innovative part of their own uh, device and their own hardware. That's one thing. Of course, uh, people tend to believe that there are limitations. Mostly, I would say, there are some limitations. Uh, for example, you can't use GPS without a proper license in space. You have to take a license from uh, the American government to use that in space because the, these kind of devices uh, could be used, but they are specialized GPS devices. They are not generic thing. Um, components that you have to buy to create your own hardware. Uh, but yeah, uh, in general, since we mostly uh, export our satellites to the United States in order for them to get launched, it's not that complicated, meaning that yeah, there has some paper there there is paperwork to be done too. But uh, if you are working in open source, I believe it's even more easy. You can uh, easily say, you know something, here's the um, things I'm gonna put in orbit. You have to document this kind of stuff. It's really interesting to see that when you are launching a satellite, especially if you are launching through the International Space Station, they will ask you what kind of components you have, all of them, because it's the same piece of hardware with astronauts. So you don't want to interfere with their everyday to day operations. There are people out there. Uh, they ask you to provide them with a bill of materials, exact bill of material. If you're open source, it's easy for you to give it out. Why not? You have it on a website, for God's sake. And uh, that's 
in in my humble opinion that's really interesting and really liberating if you like uh, and on the other hand it means that by building uh, open source technologies for space uh, mm. we can give an opportunity for people to uh, get up and uh, have the chance to launch the especially if it's open source. Uh, it's a complicated process. Uh, I believe that in the future we will see solutions based on open source uh, technology, other hours or from other people. But it's a long term process. Don't forget that it's slow sometimes. It's not, that's normal. You need to test stuff and you need to test a lot before you put something in order. Yeah. yeah. So I, uh, I think, I think that's really like uh, inspiring to think about, especially from where space technologies have come from and uh, from where they are right now. So, like uh, the work so far that has been done is actually tremendous, and uh, it's really inspiring to see that uh, some of this work has been done in uh, quite a short period of time. So anyway, so uh, like you've been speaking about uh, open source, uh, so could you like uh, maybe talk about more about this hardware that you use in terms of uh, collaborating the changes and uh, managing uh, this uh, technology? Yeah, so, okay. Um, it's, uh, a really uh, um, challenging thing to develop a uh, hardware, and uh, to some extent, uh, you can uh, develop a uh, open source hardware uh, remotely, totally. Um, we have tools. Um, GitLab is a great solution. Um, um, using um, KitKat and FreeCAD uh, is a life changer for some people. Um, uh, even uh, now, nowadays, a lot of stuff can be done uh, in an open source manner, uh, remotely. Um, we are trying to even implement uh, testing facilities especially uh, for uh, radio frequency uh, communications and stuff like that, that are uh, totally remote. We can actually have uh, a couple of computers and a couple of uh, socially defined radios and uh, do several experiments with different kind of co kinds of conditions. Um, and that will simulate uh, interference and signal to noise radio losses in order to uh, have a better uh, development uh, system uh, on how you work. I mean, it's, uh, that, that's to some extent is imperative uh, to test your equipment. But on the other hand, access to physical space, to physical uh, machines and infrastructure and, uh, and people that will work with you in order to build stuff is imperative. Um, uh, that's why um, the Windows Space Foundation started from a local hackerspace. And uh, that's why um, the Blue Space Foundation continues to use the local hyperspace as its headquarters. Because uh, uh, it's a, a more, uh, uh, I would say, and it's more community based. 
which is our thing actually. okay so i understand you know like uh, uh like uh, haka, haka, like uh, i understand that. like haka space is a physical space is it both you are you doing you know that to make sure you know like like uh, so people are able to collaborate together and uh, could you maybe give us a, a clear snapshot of what exactly happens once you're at Hacker Day on like a normal Hacker Day where people are trying to collaborate and uh, build uh, solutions? Sure. So here's the thing. Um, Hacker Space is a, a physical space. Um, from what I can tell from my own hackerspace, hackerspace.jr, which is a hackerspace in Athens. Um, it's a, a physical space devoted to open source hardware and software, meaning that there is a part of the facility, part of the place that uh, facilitates uh, small conferences, presentations. Um, um, small offices that people can in, uh, open source software and hardware and can do their meetings and stuff like that. Uh, it has um, access to um, it's a small library that people can uh, read their books, um, share books about open source and open uh, technologies and technologies in general sometimes. And on the other hand, uh, it provides not only a meeting place, a place you can collaborate physically, but not infrastructure to build stuff, like right? uh, you need access to a couple of 3D printers, um, a lathe, a vice, um, CNC's, uh, laser cut, uh, a proper electronic lab, we have oscilloscopes and uh, equipment, uh, you need uh, radio and stuff like that. So what we do is uh, we actually serve that kind of infrastructure. For example, if you build a space uh, foundation and needs uh, to get some equipment. Like uh, um, CNC or laser cut. It, uh, Little Space Foundation security will buy. Uh, but instead of uh, putting it on uh, a lab that we only Little Space Foundation has access, what we do is say, you know, some that's a uh, machine that we produce open source stuff so even when we are not working at it people are able to do open source stuff to create open source stuff with it so yeah. uh, we, we will have it on a, a local hacker space and people are you know building a, an open source of rov um, a small like a submarine thing um can work since we are not working on that uh, or uh, if people are interested on what we are doing and uh, how we are uh, a, a, a satellite on a satellite deployer they can come on the day that we uh, integrate these systems inside the deployer so people can actually see hardware that will go in space. Um, okay, that will, uh, space on its clean box, it's a specialized box that you can uh, have it really clean and uh, uh, not uh, to be exposed to any, anything at all, actually because you have to have everything clean and be statically safe and stuff like that because you go to space 
We don't yeah. have a lot of chance every day. So, but people can stay around and actually watch people working on uh, hardware that will go to space. That's really interesting. I haven't seen it uh, everywhere else, anywhere else. At least I don't have that kind of experience. And it was really interesting to see a uh, uh, teacher of uh, a university watching people, uh, engineers uh, building a uh, uh, satellite, and on the other side of the king box, you could see uh, a kid, uh, yeah. um, a girl uh, going to high school with her mom, taking uh, taking out the engineer working on uh, the satellite. It was really awesome, really inspiring. Uh, inspiring. Um, I think that kind of uh, uh, in, uh, in my humble opinion. Uh, it's a good chance to operate one, especially with COVID right now. But uh, it's a great challenge. It's a really interesting thing to do. It's, it's actually inspiring, you know, like to see people, you know, working together in the uh, same space and uh, just collaborating because, you know, I, I, I feel like uh, most of these ideas get to be spread and uh, when once they're shared and uh, people are collaborating and uh, exchanging thoughts on uh, what exactly could be improved or what exactly could be added. So it's just something to see, like it's uh, really inspiring to see that there is this, uh, you know, like space whereby people are, are basically focusing on like working on uh, these hardware technologies. So, in your opinion, do you feel like uh, such spaces, such as uh, hackerspace, and have like uh, like uh, an, an an impact that they they could possibly create in the future in terms of uh, these space technologies? And what others other ways do you think you could possibly encourage people to get involved in? You know, like. Uh, being around these spaces where they can access uh, some of these uh, satellite technologies? Uh, personally, I would believe, I believe that um, within a, a hyperspace, your own local community doesn't have one, is a great challenge. Um, something that if you have uh, Several people around you uh, that share your ideals. It's a uh, local community. Um, it's something that you should be, in my humble opinion, open for all. And that's a challenge. But it's an, it's an interesting challenge. Um, in the regard that it's focused on open source. These kind of uh, places uh, can promote open source. It doesn't have to be open space technology, in my humble opinion. Even a contribution to any open source package. On the long term, that can be used even in space. Uh, you wouldn't imagine that the guy uh, that first started working on this, um, I don't know, uh, Django, with the, uh, for those who don't know, uh, Django is a web uh, framework based in Python. Yeah, 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 uh, I know Django. Expect uh, to know that uh, Django would be used for a uh, Satellite ground station network? What the hell is a satellite ground station? Uh, it's a, it it's wasn't incredible something how... that they have in mind. I mean, so by working on uh, open source, any open source project, you can have impact in um, industries and in uh, places you don't know they exist. One thing yeah. is that. 
the other thing uh, if you want to be focused on uh, working uh, on um, participating in open source based technology I believe that uh the foundation is a good uh, place to start I mean come on uh, I am uh, biased on that of course um, <laughs> but the thing is that yeah honestly I am but the thing is that uh, many parts of the code are simply enough for me. I'm not a good coder. Um, the, the tasks in our GitLab um, uh, organization, it's uh, gitlab.com slash liberty foundation, one word. Uh, but you can see that ah, that's an issue that I can tackle. It's an interesting issue. The communities are the, uh, the people who work on, uh, on, uh, the, on uh, open source development uh, projects are really welcoming. Uh, can really guide people on uh, how they can contribute, and we've seen that. Uh, especially now with uh, Google Summer of Code, uh, that uh, a lot of people uh, that are not not comfortable with open source in general, not uh, with uh, open space technology in particular, they can contribute and they can contribute interesting things, things that you don't have the time and the resources to always think about sometimes. Uh, um, and make us to make us think out of the box, which is really interesting. And I believe that uh, taking out the code, uh, speaking with the community uh, of all our open source projects, uh, can uh, is an interesting. Um, it's actually an interesting uh, thing by itself, to be honest. Uh, even if you don't get to contribute because you know oh, we don't have enough time or it's, it seems a little bit complicated, you learn something. And uh, if you, uh, and after some time, you will be comfortable on taking up a challenge. It's uh, really interesting. Sometimes you see people that are interested in contributing, they hit on a wall because um sometimes what they are interested in need some expertise um they are pointed out to the proper resources and after some while you see that what they are contributing is uh top of the line yeah so, so it's, uh, it's it's just really inspiring, you know, like uh, seeing people w with, uh, you know, like a limited background trying to come up and then contribute, you know, like to issues. Because uh, I personally feel like uh, in my journey as a, an open source contributor, I feel like uh, one of the things that always stand out is the fact that uh, there is just minimal small tasks that you can be able to contribute to. So these yeah. tasks, uh, yeah, these tasks really encourage, you know, you to contribute, especially when you finish working on these small tasks and then there's uh, another task available for you to work on. So they're just encouraging enough for anybody to start, you know, like uh, contributing to like a project, even when they feel like they don't have the time. Yeah. Okay, so... We humbled me on uh, seeing how the community cooperate. Is that um, several of our contributors are, are well known as scientists? Um, yeah. They are famous for, for their work. And some of them don't even see me. You can see a guy, a girl, working with another person. Um, giving them directions, pointing them out, simple stuff, and uh, you know, describing the really basic stuff. 
And uh, when you actually realize that that guy that had uh, you know, spent a couple of hours of his day uh, from his uh, family and uh, kids and stuff like that to train you, to actually train you, uh, um, is a very wrong scientist. I mean, come on. Sometimes that, that can be a little bit. Uh, yeah. It's shocking sometimes, but it's there. I'm. I'm think. I think that we are lucky that we have such a welcoming community. In my humble opinion, yeah. I believe yeah, I'm lucky. Think... People uh, have treated me really well. Exactly. So I just feel like uh, a community is actually really important in uh, any project or any aspect because uh, it enables, you know, like people build the culture and uh, just the the resilience to push through any project. Like I think to push through any hardship and to like generally contribute, you know, like uh, ideas and thoughts and uh, to see that the thing takes motion, like whatever they are trying to work on. So it's just incredible how people come together and then they're willing to help each other regardless of whether they are being compensated for that service that they may be giving to the other person. So it's something that I have always been inspired about uh, open source software. So anyway, uh, I don't know if you have like a small demo thing that you could probably show us uh, that could maybe that, that, that basically could uh, show like uh, some contributions that one can make to the Libre Space Foundation and uh, the work that you do. Yeah, I would, I would just recommend uh, people uh, get a job on uh, our uh, source code. And, um, uh, check it out and see how it's uh, done. I would definitely recommend checking out uh, if you're a more visual kind of person. And speaking of uh, my own uh, lack of being very communicative uh, when I'm uh, trying to teach people. Um, I would uh, recommend checking out our uh, YouTube channel. It has a lot of um, workshops on open source technology. Uh, to see how we, people use this kind of technology in space. You can actually see, um, there's around two hours maybe, a uh, workshop of uh, um, uh, an European Space Agency satellite that's actually programmed using Python. And uh, the scientists there are doing uh, machine learning things and uh, stuff like that using Python. And it's a great um, workshop because you can actually see how they do see how they collect their data and how they use that data. And that's really interesting to see and really interesting to see uh, how people can collaborate on that matter. And of course, I would say that even small stuff that look sometimes pedestrian to us uh, that are more seasoned and open source, like a small git contribution is really important and a lot of people out there a lot of uh, young uh, students of uh, even uh, um, graduates of uh, computer and, sci and uh, IT departments are not really you know, comfortable using git uh, even for that kind of thing, uh, we have a small mm. workshop for people to ah, get your hands dirty on Git. I mean, come on, let's uh, work, see how GitLab works at least. That's we, because we mostly use GitLab. And uh, even that, it's important. Even if you don't contribute to our own open source project, 
mm -hmm. believe that uh, getting a hang of uh, working together, collaborating with other people, I mean, the club is a nice way to do that, uh, is important. It's really important, actually. Yeah, it's, it's actually important, you know, like, um... I, I feel like uh, most of these contributions, you know, like um, they, they they basically just uh, help you to learn, like you have said, most of the graduates of like computer science sometimes may not probably know how to use uh, like products like Git or maybe GitHub. So basically when you're involved, you know, like in this contributor experience, you're able to learn this knowledge, you're able to you know, like expand your understanding of a topic. Because uh, for example, most of the time, when I look at uh, new projects that I'm trying to contribute to, I I sort of uh, look for maybe like the simplest thing I can do. And then I move yeah. from that stage, yeah. I move from that stage whereby I'm giving like a small contributions and I go on to make the larger contributions. And I found that to be really useful in terms of, you know, gradually expanding my knowledge on like that particular project. So yeah, I think it's, uh, it's really good for people to start with the small basics, like you have said. Even even small documentation projects. I mean, uh, putting things and things together and say, you know, something uh, uh, should be expand that uh, example you've got there. Even that, it's really important. I've seen it a lot of times. You know how it's done. People are working on developing and they don't have enough time or focus or whatever you want to call it uh, to proper document stuff. And uh, even that is a lost opportunity and people that are um, getting uh, on board a new uh, project, either it's a uh, space or something else, doesn't matter. Even adding a few lines that are useful to the documentation page is a lifesaver. Yeah. It's a great way to contribute to open source too. It's a, sure is a, a great way, you know, like to start contributing. I mean, when, once you start, you know, like contributing, it also takes away, you know, like that initial fear that you may have at the start, yeah. you know, when you're uncomfortable with the project. So you just uh, get to feel comfortable with uh, this technology step by step. And uh, I think uh, I've also worked on, you know, like uh, with Django, like, uh, and then uh, one of mm. the things was, you know, like uh, going on to like a project the, the very first time was, of course, scary. And I didn't know exactly what I was doing or with the project. So, and when I was able, you know, like to work on a few things, then I understood the flow of the project. So like, I know like, okay, this yeah. is how everything moves from this state. So now I went from just, you know, struggling to make like a contribution to knowing exactly how the the, soft, the software works in that I could basically now also like uh, make a newer feature uh, that is not necessarily like fixing maybe a bug. So yeah, so I, I, I just feel like uh, taking small, smaller, smaller steps uh, is uh, much more important than, you know, like people try to tend to, I think maybe picture their contribution to be to be something maybe superficial or something that is just uh, extremely recognizable. But I feel, yeah, people maybe in the open source uh, field should honor more of these small contributions because uh, they really change the lives of uh, these uh, new contributors because uh, they bring some feeling of joy and sense of accomplishment in maybe someone who hasn't really been contributing on that level. So they just uh, have a way they change the lives of uh, new contributors, most especially. Yeah, so anyway, so I, 
Yeah, so so I was saying like uh, thank you so much for your time and uh, I don't know like uh, maybe let, let's uh, end the recording and then yeah